Well, hello, and welcome back to our study in Ezekiel. <clears throat> uh, hopefully you've had a chance to read chapters 8 through 11. Uh, if not, uh, you might want to pause and go ahead and read those chapters just so uh, you'll be caught up. We will be reading a lot of the text, uh, but it helps you to have all of that information uh, kind of in the back of your brain. Uh, so as we're going through, uh, I'll just reiterate that uh, just continue to try and keep up with your readings through the week if you can. Uh, our study together will have a lot more meaning uh, if you do. <clears throat> uh, so up to this point, we've seen Ezekiel has had a vision uh, of, of, of God being carried in by these cherubim. Uh, that's quite the spectacle. And God calls Ezekiel as a prophet. And uh, things that are important for Ezekiel's calling is that he's being called to a rebellious and obstinate people. And these people are not going to listen, but Ezekiel is to preach God's message, whether the people listen or not. Uh, and then uh, as you get into chapters 4 through 7, quickly God is calling Ezekiel to do uh, some kind of street ministry, if you will. Uh, he's called to, to, to do some acts among the people uh, that are going to demonstrate the prophecies. Uh, and so Ezekiel is laying siege to a brick uh, which is symbolic of the city of Jerusalem, uh, and he's supposed to lay on his side for a number of days, and he's supposed to eat a, a very small amount of food. And all of this is to show that God's judgment is coming upon his people. Uh, so that brings us uh, to chapter 8. Uh, and chapter 8 is going to help us to see, uh, it's going to actually help Ezekiel to see, and us as well, why God is bringing this judgment upon the nation of Israel. And uh, it would be it's going to be really important for Ezekiel uh, because he's bringing these messages of judgment and destruction uh, and God wants Ezekiel to see firsthand uh, some of the abominations that are going on back in Jerusalem uh, so uh, let's read verses one through four uh, and then we'll get into uh, the visions uh, in the of the temple all right chapter eight Ezekiel chapter eight verse one. And it came about in the sixth year, on the fifth day of the sixth month, as I was sitting in my house with the elders of Judah sitting there before me, that the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. Then I, I looked, and behold, a likeness of the appearance of a man. From his loins and downward there was the appearance of fire, and from his loins and upward the appearance of brightness, like the appearance of glowing metal. And he stretched out to the form of a hand and caught me by the lock of my head. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the idol of jealousy, which provoked to jealousy, was located. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there like the appearance which I, had saw, which I saw in the plain. All right, so here's Ezekiel uh, is going to be taken uh, from uh, where he's at in Babylon by the River Chebar, you know, where, where he's living. Uh, he's going to be taken in this vision to Jerusalem, to the temple. Uh, this vision is about uh, one year later than the first. If you look at chapter 1, verse 2, we're about a year later. Uh, and that kind of accounts for all the time that Ezekiel had been laying on his side uh, and all of the, those types of things. Uh, uh, so uh, Ezekiel meets this figure. Uh, he has the appearance of his man, uh, of a man. His loins uh, downward are like fire, and upwards are like brightness and glowing metal. This is very similar to what we saw in chapter one when Ezekiel was describing the presence of God. Although he could kind of just barely make it out, uh, this is very similar to that description. Uh, so he's carried off by the presence of God to Jerusalem, to this north gate. Uh, and there were three gates uh, going into the temple. Uh, as, uh, and so he's being led into this one that was in the outer or in the inner court. He's at the north gate of the inner court where he starts to see uh, these abominations. All right, there's going to be four abominations that we're going to see uh, moving through here. And so uh, we'll just grab them one at a time and just see what Ezekiel sees. So uh, verses five and six. Then he said to me, Son of man, raise your eyes now towards the north. So I raised my eyes towards the north. And behold, 
To the north of the altar gate was the idol of jealousy at the entrance. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel are committing here, that I should be far from my sanctuary. But yet you will see still greater abominations. All right, so he, he comes in and, and he sees this idol of jealousy. We've already been kind of primed by that in verses 3 and 4, that, that there was this idol of jealousy. And, and, and what is this idol of jealousy? Well, Ezekiel doesn't tell us. Maybe Ezekiel knew. It wasn't that long ago that Ezekiel was in Jerusalem that he would have been familiar with the temple and the things that were going on in the temple. So maybe when Ezekiel talks about the idol of jealousy, it's right, you know, it, it's obvious to him. Uh, but uh, since it doesn't say, let me just give you a potential, a maybe, uh, and, and we're not really sure exactly, but maybe if you go back to 2 Kings chapter 21, Manasseh set up an idol to Asherah in the house of the Lord. All right now, that was that was very bold to be able to set up uh, an idol in the temple. Uh, and so because of his wickedness, God allows the Babylonians to come and take him off uh, into uh, captivity by himself uh, with hooks. And they take him to Babylon. And there, Manasseh cries out to God. And God hears his cry and restores him to uh, his place in Jerusalem. And when he's restored as king in Jerusalem, he tears down that idol and he gets rid of it. Well, Something must have happened uh, between him, uh, between Manasseh tearing that idol down. It must have got restored sometime, probably during the reign of Ammon. Because when we get to Josiah, Josiah is going to tear it down again. So most likely, Manasseh erected it and then tore it down. Then his son Ammon erected it. And then Josiah comes along and tears it down. And then one of Josiah's successors must have replaced it, uh, which would not have been uncommon considering uh, Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin and Zedekiah uh, and, and their allegiances. Uh, one of them erected it yet again because when Ezekiel is taken back to Jerusalem, that's what he sees, uh, this, this repetitive struggle with idolatry. And it wasn't just idolatry over there. It was in the house of God, in the temple right there, uh, right in the inner court. Uh, so <clears throat> why is this called the idol of jealousy? Well, I think it's because this of all places, this idol is in the temple, uh, and which is God's house where his presence is dwelling. And so of all the idolatry within the nation, uh, this would have probably provoked God the most. Uh, and this is why in verse six, uh, we're going to see God leaving his sanctuary. Uh, okay, uh, let's get the second abomination, uh, verses 7 through 13. The second thing that Ezekiel is going to see. Uh, then he brought me to the entrance of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And he said to me, Son of man, now dig through the wall. So I dug through the wall, and behold, an entrance. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations that are committed there. So I entered and looked, and behold, Every form of creeping thing and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of house of Israel were carved on the wall all around. And standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel with Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, standing among them, each man with his censer in his hand and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. Then he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark? each man in the room of his carved image. For they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. And he said to me, Yet you will see greater abominations, which they are committing. All right, so here we have this hidden idolatry of the nation uh, of the elders, the elders of Judah. Uh, this is taking place in the holy place. And, and, and Ezekiel uh, comes in through this hole and, and he goes through this door. And there's these pictures of idols all over the wall. And there's Jazaniah standing there among these elders uh, offering incense. And Jazaniah is the son of Shaphan. And I don't know if you remember Shaphan, uh, but he was uh, the son of, uh, well, he was uh, uh, 
one of the servants during Josiah's reign that you recall when Hilkiah found the book of the law, it was Shaphan, the scribe, who read it to Josiah. Well, this is his son. Shaphan was a good man, uh, but apparently his son, Jazaniah, uh, was not a good man. Uh, and so uh, there they are. Uh, he seems to be an influential person. They have uh, these elders who are, sa are offering incense there in the dark. And why are they doing it? Well, it's because they feel like God has abandoned them. Like they say in verse 12, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. And that's their idea. And so they've turned to these other gods. God has not forsaken them. They have forsaken God. And he's allowed Babylon to come against them. Uh, but uh, God is still there, still being hurt by their, their idolatry. And so they've turned their attention to all these other gods. Uh, and it is hurting hurting God indeed. Uh, if you haven't noticed, there's a phrase that's going to be uh, coming through. We're going to see it six times through these abominations. If you go back up to uh, verse six, notice he says, and he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? That phrase, do you see, occurs multiple times, six times. Uh, look at verse nine. He said, go in and go in and see the wicked abominations. Then in verse 12, son of man, do you see? And then verse 13, and yet he said to me, yet you will see still greater. And, and then again in verse 15, he asks him, do you see? And again in verse 17. And all of this to show uh, Ezekiel the abominations that are going on in Jerusalem. This was not just uh, something that, that God was seeing. This was not something that, was, uh, that Ezekiel was going to prophesy against without having any exposure to. I think God wanted Ezekiel to see just how ugly things had gotten in Jerusalem. So that when Ezekiel prophesied judgment, he would know that God was right and just in bringing that judgment. All right, the third abomination is in verses 14 and 15. This is the third thing that Ezekiel is taken to see. Then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which is towards the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. And he said to me, Do you see this, son of man? Yet you will see greater abominations than these. Tammuz was a Babylonian deity. He was worshipped uh, in Babylon and in a lot of the surrounding areas. A lot of those nations kind of swapped gods uh, as both political allegiances and, and as far as religious allegiances as well. Uh, but Tammuz supposedly controlled uh, the floodwaters of the Euphrates and the Tigris. And so he was responsible for bringing the rains and, and, and raising the river so that the crops uh, would be watered. Uh, and so during the spring, Tammuz was present and then he was bringing rains and, the, and everything was, was growing and lush. Uh, and then, you know, in the fall, Tammuz would leave and the rains would leave and uh, the, the, the ground would dry up and uh, he would, Tammuz was seen to be going into the underworld and, and abandoning his people. And so the women would cry out for him to return and, and to bring the rains yet again. And so here they are in the temple of God, weeping and praying that Tammuz would return to water the land. Instead of calling on Jehovah, they're calling on Tammuz. Our fourth abomination is in verse 16. He brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the entrance to the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, there were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they were prostrating themselves eastward towards the sun. And he said to me, Do you see this, son of man? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they have committed here, that they have filled the land with violence and provoked me repeatedly? For behold, they are putting the twig to their nose. Therefore, I indeed shall deal in wrath. My eye will have no pity, nor shall I spare. And though they cry in my eyes, or in my ears with loud voice, they will, yet I shall not listen to them. All right, so here we have uh, these 25 men who are facing east, right? And they're they're worshiping east. And, and these would be priests in order for them to have, to be this far in, uh, in the temple. And they're facing east and worshiping the sun. 
right? And they have this twig in their nose. Uh, if you'll notice that they've, uh, in, at the end of verse 17, they've put the twig to their nose. Not really sure exactly what that means. A lot of the reading that I've done, the best thing that, that seems to make sense is uh, that uh, when they would put this twig to their nose, it was obviously very insulting to the Lord. Uh, and one document talked about uh, how they would take a, a bundle of twigs and when they were worshiping the sun, they would put it in front of their mouth so that their breath didn't defile uh, their God as, it, as, it, as the sun rose uh, and as they worshiped. And so maybe maybe that's what it's referring to. Uh, I don't know, but whatever it was, it was it was offensive, very offensive to God. And this is a great abomination. Uh, that these uh, these 25 priests are worshiping the sun right there in the temple. And so, verse 18, God says he's going to bring his wrath. The nation of Israel has, has turned to other gods. They have made room in the temple for other gods. They are openly worshiping other gods in the temple. And it just destroys God. All right, so that's chapter 8. Uh, Ezekiel is taken to the temple and he sees firsthand the abominations that are taking place. Uh, chapters 9 and 10, uh, or, or chapter 9 is going to deal with God cleansing this, these abominations. And then chapters 10 and 11 are going to describe God's presence leaving the temple. Uh, so uh, let's look at uh, the, uh, the cleansing of the temple in chapter 9. Uh, we'll just go ahead and read the whole chapter. And then we'll kind of make some observations uh, about it. All right, Ezekiel 9. Then he cried out in the hearing with a loud voice, saying, Draw near, O executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his shattering weapon in his hand. And among them was a certain man clothed in linen, with a writing case at his loins. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Then the glory of God, the God of Israel, went up from the cherub on which he had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed in linen at whose loins was a writing case. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the forehead of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in the midst. But to the others, he said in my hearing, go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity nor and, and do not spare. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little children and women, but do not touch any man on whom is the mark. And you shall start from my sanctuary. So they started with the elders who, had, who were before the temple. And he said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. Thus they went out and struck down the people in the city. Then it came about as they were striking that I alone was left. And I fell on my face and cried out, saying, Alas, Lord God, art thou destroying the whole remnant of Israel by pouring out thy wrath on Jerusalem? Uh, oh, sorry. I guess, let's, we'll finish the chapter. Uh, verse 9. Then he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is very, very great. And the land is filled with blood, and the city is full of perversion. For they say, The Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord does not see. But as for me, my eye will have no pity, nor shall I spare, but I shall bring their conduct upon their heads. Then behold, the man clothed in linen at whose loins was a writing case, reported, saying, I have done just as thou hast commanded me. All right, so we have we have three characters here. We have the executioners, right? And there's six of them, and they have these destroying rep, destroying weapons uh, in verse 1, or shattering weapons in verse 2, or you might have different words there. Uh, but their job is to destroy everyone who is not mourning the abominations that are taking place. Right? So they're bringing the judgment on people who are, who are not bothered at all by this idolatry that's going on. All right? Secondly, we have this man that's clothed in linen, and he has a writing case on his side. Right? And his job is to mark all the people who 
uh, do sigh and groan over the abominations. All the people that are bothered by this idolatry. And he's to, to keep a record of all these people. And he's to place a mark on them. And we'll talk about that mark. Uh, and then the third character is the glory of the God of Israel. And he leaves the cherubim and you know, that he was seated over, over that firmament that was over the cherubim. And he comes into the temple as if he's, he is there on the scene uh, as this takes place. And so we see that the innocent are marked. Those who uh, abhor the abominations that are taking place, they're marked uh, with a, a mark. Uh, the word that's uh, the word for mark in verse four that you might have uh, that is used there is just the last word in the Hebrew alphabet or the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's called a tav. Uh, and back in Ezekiel's day, interestingly, it was almost not quite an X. It was kind of an offset X uh, that would have looked very much like a cross. Obviously, the cross had no meaning in Ezekiel's day and didn't really have any meaning until uh, the New Testament comes along. Uh, but could it be? I don't know. Maybe. It could be a, a really interesting little sign here that, that God is going to go through the city and he's going to mark his people, those who are faithful to him, with a cross. And all of those people who have this mark will be spared. Uh, and then the guilty, those who do not have this mark, uh, are going to be slaughtered. Those who are participating in the idolatry and those who are not mourning the idolatry. The executioners are to have no pity and to spare no one. And the executioners start with the elders. They start with a leadership that should have been directing God's people in the right way, should have been uh, against this idolatry should have been tearing down these idols and, and and covering over those those pictures on the walls but no they were participating in it and god says start with the leadership those who had a responsibility to lead the people bring judgment upon them first and why are the the end result of all of this is that ezekiel is left alone well, what does that tell you about the wickedness of jerusalem God's wrath is complete, and their iniquity, interestingly, in verse 9, God says, it's very, very great, and the land is filled with blood. What a horrible image for Ezekiel to witness, but what an, an amazing conclusion that God is bringing judgment upon his own people because they are just rank in idolatry, and they have abandoned him. Is God taking joy in this? You don't see any, anywhere in any of this where God is taking joy in any of this. And as a matter of fact, later on in chapter 33, verse 11, we'll find out specifically that God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. None at all. He would much, obviously much rather, that they repented and turned from their idolatry and served him. Which is really what uh, the captivity is all about. is to shake the people up and get them out of idolatry to come back to God. Well, that's chapter 9. God is, is sending his executioners through the city of Jerusalem to cleanse it. And he's marking those who are faithful to him and uh, the, the rest are destroyed. All right, that takes us to uh, chapter 10 where God is going to withdraw his presence uh, from the temple. Uh, we're just going to read verses 1 through 8 uh, and uh, then we'll summarize, we'll just kind of encapsulate the rest of the chapter. All right, Ezekiel chapter 10. Then I looked, and behold, in the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim, something like a sapphire stone, an appearance resembling a throne, appeared above them. And he spoke to the man clothed in linen and said, Enter between the whirling wheels above under the cherubim and fill your hand with the coals of fire from between the cherubim and scattered them over the city. And he entered in my sight. Now the cherubim were standing on the right side of the temple when a man entered, and the cloud filled the inner court. When the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the temple, and the temple was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Moreover, the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard as far as the outer court like the voice of the God Almighty when he speaks. And it came about 
when he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, Take fire from between the whirling wheels, from between the cherubim. And he entered and stood beside a wheel. Then the cherub stood, stretched out his hand from between the cherubim to the fire, which was between the cherubim, took some, put it in his hand of one of the, of the one clothed in linen, who took it and went out. And the cherubim appeared to have the form of a man's hand under their wings. All right, so uh, here we have God is bringing fire on the city. You have this, the man that's clothed in linen. Remember, uh, his job was to go through and, and, and mark the people. Well, now he's commanded to go get the coals that are burning uh, that's between the cherubim and the wheels, like in that uh, over there, you know, that, that thing that was transporting the presence of God. He's to go get some of those coals and fire and bring them and scatter them over the city in verse 2. And the glory of the Lord leaves the cherubim, goes to the temple, and the cherub hands the man in linen these coals. So it's like the cherub uh, has a, the form of a human hand under his wings. Well, the whole purpose of this is to destroy the city. And God has just, God has washed his hands of Jerusalem. And so then the, the rest of the chapter, verses 9 through 22, is, is another description of these cherubim and the wheels and the firmament that we saw back in chapter 1. So we're not going to go through that, but I do want to point out verse 18. So chap chapter 10, verse 18. It says, Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. So God came to the temple, brought his judgment upon it, and now he's leaving the temple and he goes back to the cherubim. All right, chapter... 11. All right, now we have uh, this, this promise for a remnant as God is withdrawing from the city. Uh, all right, let's read verses 1 through 4. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which faced eastward. And behold, there were 25 men at the entrance of the gate. And among them I saw Jazaniah, son of Azur, and Pelatiah, son of Benaiah, leaders of the people. And he said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give evil advice in the city, who say, Is not the time near to build houses? The city is a pot, and we are the flesh. Therefore prophesy against them, son of man, prophesy. All right, so uh, here we have uh, he, he comes back into this vision. Uh, he's, he's taken to the east gate, uh, and he's faced eastward, and there's these 25 men at the entrance of the gate. Uh, they are prophesying uh, terrible things. And one of them, I don't know if he's, yeah, he's among them, is Jazaniah. Now, this is a different Jazaniah than we just saw uh, back in chapter 8, because he has a different father. Uh, but still, not a good man. Uh, he's misleading the people. Their evil advice is, hey, everybody, you don't need to worry. The city is safe. Have you seen this city? This city is safe. As a matter of fact, this city is a pot, and we're the flesh inside the pot. Like, this is our sanctuary. We're safe in here. Nobody can hurt us in here. And so God says, prophesy against them. Uh, <clears throat> so, verses. let's read verses uh, 5 through 12. Then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and he said to me, Say, Thus says the Lord, So you think, house of Israel, for I know your thoughts. You have multiplied your slain in the city, filling its streets with them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Your slain whom you have laid in the midst of the city are the flesh, and the city is the pot, but I shall bring you out of it. You have feared a sword, so I will bring a sword upon you, the Lord God declares. And I shall bring you out of the midst of the city, and I shall deliver you into the hands of strangers and execute judgment against you. You will fall by the sword. I will judge you to the border of Israel, and you will know that I am the Lord. This city will not be a pot for you, nor will you be flesh in the midst of it, but I shall judge you to the border of Israel. Thus you will know uh, that I am the Lord. For you have not walked in my statutes, nor have you executed my ordinances, but have acted according to the ordinances of the nations around you. 
So uh, God uh, tells Ezekiel to prophesy against the city. And he says, look, you think that your flesh inside this pot? <clears throat> he says, no, I'm going to call you out of that. You think that you're safe inside that city? I'm going to bring a sword against you and I'm going to call you out of your safe place. This city is not going to be a safe place for you. And so God specifically says uh, that the, the opposite is true in verse 9. He says, I will bring you out of the city and I shall deliver you into the hands of strangers and execute judgment against you. This city will not be a pot for you. This will not be a safe place for you. And again, yet again, the people were putting their safety and their trust in a wall and not in God. And God can bring down a wall. So when the people trust in themselves and they trust in cities and walls, God brings judgment. All right, let's pick it up in verse 13, and we'll read down through 21. Now it came about that as I prophesied, that as I prophe prophesied that Pelatiah, son of Benaiah, died, then I fell on my face and cried out with a loud voice and said, Alas, Lord God, wilt thou bring the remnant of Israel to a complete end? Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, your brothers, your relatives, your fellow exiles, and the whole house of Israel, all of them, all those to whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord, Though I have removed them far away from the nations, and though I have scattered them among the countries, yet I was a sanctuary for them a little while in the countries where they had gone. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I shall gather you from the people and assemble you out of your countries among which you have been scattered, and I shall give you the land of Israel. When they come, when they come there, they will remove all the detestable things and all the abominations from it, and I shall give them one heart and shall put a new spirit within them, and I shall take their heart of stone out of a and I shall take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. And they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people, and I shall be their God. But as for those hearts who go on, go after detestable things and abominations, I shall bring their conduct down on their heads, declares the Lord. <clears throat> so, uh, Pelatiah dies, uh, and, and this really affects Ezekiel. Uh, he's one of their leaders, and it would have been uh, very plausible for Ezekiel to have known Pelatiah. These, remember, Ezekiel was from Jerusalem. He would have known these people, and here, in his witness, uh, this man dies. And so Ezekiel cries out, and he fears that if, if the leadership is dying, then is there a salvation for the people is there is there any remnant is is the nation going to be brought to a complete end and that's his question in verse 13 and then God's going to answer that question in verses uh, 14 down through 21 that there's going to be a remnant yes God scattered the people throughout the captivity but verse 17 God's going to bring them back <clears throat> and when he brings them back look at how They'll be characterized. In verse 17, they're going to receive this their land. In verse 18, they're going to remove the detestable things and the abominations. Verse 19, they're going to have a new heart. In verse 20, they're going to keep God's ordinances, and also God will be their God. This is the answer. No, Israel's not going to come to a complete end. God is going to restore a remnant. When, and when they come back, no more will they worship these idols. No more will they go after these abominations. But they will serve and love God. Uh, and so uh, this is the whole idea of God, uh, of, of the exile being temporary. And ultimately God restoring the people back to the land. He, he plans on doing that. He will do that. Historically, that's what's going to happen. And so the, the captivity is 70 years. It's a temporary captivity, but it's going to shake the people up and it's going to 
get them back on track with God. Uh, all right, uh, then our last few verses, 22 through 25. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of God of Israel hovered over them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain, which is east of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God to the exiles in Chaldea. So the vision which I had seen left me. And I told the exiles all the things which the Lord had shown to me. And so here's the end of Ezekiel's vision. God's spirit leaves the temple and it goes and it rests on a mountain as, as if to say God's, God is done with Jerusalem. He's brought judgment upon it, yet he has promised that a remnant would return. And Ezekiel, his vision is completed. He's taken back to Chaldea where uh, he's going to speak of these things to the people so that they would know of the abominations that are happening in Jerusalem. Uh, and so uh, some of the, the hard questions uh, that come about through all of this is we start to see uh, God's judgment on his own people. And at what point does God's patience end? How many hundreds of years had God called Israel and Judah back out of idolatry, and they, they refused repeatedly. How many prophets did God send? And so there's a hard question of when does God's patience end? When is sin so great that God refuses to deal with it anymore? When does his mercy cease, and when does his judgment begin? When does his wrath replace his grace? These are hard questions, uh, but Ezekiel is an answer to those questions. That there is a point, there's a breaking point when God's grace is no longer being applied to people. And instead, he's bringing wrath upon them. In this case, he's bringing uh, the Babylonians and a captivity and a judgment and a loss of their homes and their lands and everything that they have, their freedom. And a lot of them will lose their lives. Yet God will restore them back eventually. And so the question is, how far does God is God willing to go to bring his people back from idolatry and back from sin? How far is God willing to go with you? How far is he willing to go with me to bring us back to righteousness, to call us out of sin and back into righteousness? God's patience does have an end. Are we people who push that boundary? Are we people that push the limits of God's forgiveness? I hope we're not. I hope we're openly repentant people who turn back to God every chance we get. Every time we realize that we've turned away from him, we quickly turn right back to him. That's his desire. He has. It takes no pleasure in bringing judgment on us, but he will. He will call us back to righteousness in whatever it takes. That's Ezekiel 8 through 11. Next week, we'll be covering chapters 12 through 19. Right, that's seven chapters, so we're not going to be able to read like we have been. We're just going to be able to take sections. Uh, we'll probably only be able to read about half of it total, and so we're going to be jumping around. So definitely uh, make sure that you read chapters 12 through 19 uh, for next week, uh, and I'll see you then. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, your love and for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness, for your patience with us. Father, I, I'm sorry that at times we, we try your patience and we push you. Uh, and yet, God, I pray that you would just call us to repentance. Help us to have open eyes that see the sin in our lives and help us to see the paths of righteousness that you lay before us. God, give us soft hearts that turn to you, hearts that, that run from wickedness, and embrace righteousness. Help us to learn from the mistakes of Israel and Judah. Help us, Father, to, to rid our lives of things that we would trust instead of you. And help us to just completely trust in you. Strengthen us in those things, Father. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.